Many of the diamonds we have, they come originally from South Africa. Nowadays, they're also quarried in, uh, for instance, uh, Australia and in Siberia. But they come up in these volcanic pipes. We call them diatremes. They're a bit, they're shaped like a champagne glass. And uh, they bring volcanic, volcanic material from deep inside the Earth. And diamonds are just carbon, but they're carbon that we're exposed to huge amounts of pressure. And then they become really hard. They build this beautifully hard crystal structure. And uh, if the magma rises up very, very fast, the carbon will not change its form and it will stay as a diamond. So, and uh, of course, if you kind of polish it and grind it and make it beautiful, it looks like this. But in the field, the geologist will see it in this shape. These are unpolished, uncut diamonds. Now, they can also happen in meteorite impacts, but this is very rare. So the much more easy way to make diamonds is actually via these pipes, these diatremes, the first one being from Kimberley. So they're often also referred to as Kimberlite diatreme. So another important aspect that uh, I think we need to point out is that volcanic rock was and still is used as a tool. And it was one of the first tools of mankind. When you think of obsidian, then, uh, well, you can uh, just about realize that these was th this is a volcanic glass, and these uh, rocks were very useful. If they splinter, they make these really sharp edges. And that has been used as a tool. And it's still <coughs> a very important uh, cutting tool today. Several surgeons I talked to say that cutting with obsidian blades actually has an advantage over using metal blades. The wounds heal better because once the obsidian is polished to the right degree, it actually makes a far cleaner cut. So I was really impressed. And if you think of the Guanches, the original people here on the Canaries, they didn't have metal. And when you think of the um, inhabitants of Hawaii or New Zealand, they didn't have metal either. They had weapons made of obsidian. And uh, here is a primitive knife and, of course, arrow tips and spearheads and things like that. So this was one of our major tools early on in human um, evolution. And uh, here's a few more examples. And uh, I have a particularly nice specimen that I recovered in northern Denmark. I'm not entirely sure how old it is, but uh, this is a cutting blade. And uh, I think um, we must realize that this was a... Um, a process or a feature that was really very common back in the Stone Age and really allowed us to handle materials in a very different way. So I also like to talk a little bit about abrasion materials. And this is volcanic pumice, uh, pumice stone, and it's a volcanic glass with a lot of bubbles. It's a bit fragile at times, but the material in between the bubbles, the white material here, that is actually a form of glass. And therefore, it's very hard. It's quite fragile. It breaks easily, but it's very hard. And we can use this to abrade things. And here is industrial abrasion pumice powder. And uh, here is, um, uh, for industry, an abrasion stick. And that has pumice in it. But uh, we also find that this is widely used in cosmetical products for exfoliation. So here we have a hand and foot scrub, which has pumice stone in here, as you see. And uh, there are several others, volcanic pumice stone. And um, here is one that even tries to kind of uh, bring in the concept of big volcanic eruptions being good for your um, personal hygiene. So they named their pro the product Krakatau body scrub. Well, the principle underlying these things is the same. There's very hard, small particles in there, and they, of course, are harder than any form of skin, and therefore they will abrade. And um, this is even used in some of the whitening uh, toothpaste. So here, for example, there is a little bit of pumice in there. So you're putting volcano in your mouth if you use whitening toothpaste, believe it or not. So, and... Um, when I was young, um, when I was a little boy, and blue jeans were blue and dark, and uh, 
then there was this new fashion coming up that was washed out blue jeans. And uh, they were stone washed at the time. That's what, uh, that was the term. And we were all excited as young kids about this and wanted to have stone washed jeans. Only many years later did I realize that the stone for washing stone washed jeans was actually pumice stone. So they're tumbled in a big uh, tumble dryer, if you will, together with um, pumice stone. And this will abrade uh, the blue jeans and uh, it will take the color out and, uh, well, uh, rip some pieces. It's not necessarily my fashion style today, but uh, when I was younger, this was attractive, I think. So I should also mention white stone. Porcelain has been a major revolution for us, and uh, most people underappreciate that. Think of uh, some uh, thousand years ago, certainly in Europe, we were likely eating off wooden plates, and uh, once you used them a few times, there was all sorts of things, chemical reactions happening within the wood, and not all of them favorable. And in terms of hygiene, um, the use of porcelain has been tremendously bringing us forward. Initially, this comes from China, and they used volcanic rock, old volcanic rock, in an area called Kaolin, and uh, they have been mixing it with quartz and felspar. Here's a felspar crystal, and uh, these are from granite. Granite is a volcanic rock that forms in continental areas under volcanoes. So not in oceanic areas, we don't find that particular rock in the Canaries, but we find it in continental areas, like in China, and there the accurate mixture of these components and a burning process allows you to create por porcelain and if you glaze it afterwards, if you reheat it, you can cover them with a very thin coating of glass and uh, this makes them inert to these chemical reactions that would come from food relics or things like that. And of course nowadays in uh, medical situations we would use these kind of um, um, porcelain um, applications so that we can clean them off very easily, reuse them, and we don't have to kind of worry about the um, remnants of any kind of bacteria. Sulfur. Sulfur is very important, and I'd like to say a word about that. Um, to make gunpowder uh, or dynamite, you need charcoal, potassium nitrate, and sulfur. And these days, most of our sulfur is a byproduct of uh, refining petroleum. And um, it's um, coming from oil, effectively. Now, our plan as a society is to go off fossil fuels. And that means we will actually have a shortage of sulfur in the long run. So this is one of these negative consequences that people are starting to realize now what will actually be required to go into a fossil fuel-free uh, energy society. And sulfur is going to be one of these problems. And up to about 100 years ago, sulfur was effectively mined in volcanoes. This is a sulfur mine that is still active in Indonesia. And um, I visited um, a few years ago. It's horrendous, literally horrendous. I mean, um, I had uh, full protective gear with gas masks, but most of the workers there, they don't. Still, we must also see the other side. They earn about five times more than a rice farmer outside the mine. So there is a reward for these people doing it, although I think uh, a bit more protective um, support for them would probably be a good thing. But we have mined sulfur in Europe for a long time. Much of the Sulfur, for example, the Navy, the British Navy, the Swedish Navy, etc., actually came from Iceland. And um, it's volcanic sulfur in order to make gunpowder and then conquer whoever you want to conquer, I guess. So, and uh, sulfur is still used in many parts of the world uh, for, um, for using, um <coughs> uh, for example, this soap. Um, this allows you to produce cleaner skin and uh, therefore sulfur has also another purpose there. Now, I'd like to say a few words about geothermal power. And uh, geothermal power is one of these great inventions of the last 50 years. And uh, here, we are actually using volcanic heat. And um, 
this is something that is coming more and more fashionable. Actually, while we were on Gran Canaria, I met up with a friend from the University of Las Palmas, and um, we have just secured a little contract with one of the energy companies in Spain to look at the potential of geothermal energy production on the island of Las Pal uh, on the uh, island of La Palma. Sorry, I mixed up Las Palmas and La Palma. Um, La Palma, where the recent eruption happened, and uh, there is now a lot of excess volcanic heat, and maybe that can be exploited. So the idea here is that uh, we have a heat source at depth, and we're pumping uh, down cold water, not exactly into the heat source, but close to it, and then the water will either evaporate to steam, it will be converted, or it will heat up depending on what the system is, and then either steam or hot water is uh, brought up, and there we can either use this directly for heating purposes, or we have turbines, and these turbines may then produce electricity. <laughs> so here's an image from uh, uh, New Zealand, that's the Wairaki power plant, and this is a really advanced system there, and here the volcanic steam is brought up and it's piped into certain areas, ideally into a turbine, and then electricity can be produced from that, requiring no fossil fuels or nuclear power. One problem, and that is the piping will clog up after some time. So this is actually a cut through one of the pipes, and you see after a while the piping has narrowed considerably and this means that the pipes have to be replaced after a certain time. So this is one of the downsides, so nothing is for free, but um, this is certainly something that many parts of the world will now develop, and I have talked to a colleague in Indonesia. There is uh, big plans to, for example, build several of these power plants now and therefore reduce the use of fossil fuels in those areas. So here's a Chevron run uh, geothermal pilot plant that is in uh, Java, Indonesia, and I visited there a few years, and uh, it's actually making a profit, so it's a very uh, good design, and hopefully more of this can be built in the future. So Iceland, believe it or not, Iceland produces a lot of fruit, and um, yeah, most people are surprised by that, but um, it's because of the geothermal power, the heat greenhouses with that, and the wastewater from one of those geothermal power plants is actually channeled into a pond and it's become one of Iceland's biggest tourist attractions. It's the Blue Lagoon down here. So this is actually wastewater from a geothermal plant here on the Reykjans Peninsula, close to where the eruption happened last year. And um, the water is still warm and it's very rich in silica, so it's good for your skin. And here is a little diagram showing how geothermal energy in Iceland is used. Most of it is used for making electricity and for heating uh, spaces, but greenhouses, for example, make a few percent, and um, swimming pools make another few percent here. So, and if you go to the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, then you can buy all sorts of cosmetical products there. Apparently, uh, very popular in Asia, so this is why most of the labels are bigger in a certain Asian uh, writing. And um, here you can take the volcanic mud, if you will, and uh, apply it to your skin, and it's very good for your skin. It cleans the skin, and it has abrasive qualities. So people going to the Blue Lagoon, they uh, may apply then some of these volcanic mods, and then they can be flavored with different things, and then they take different colors, but the original mod is actually just white in color. So, <coughs> talking about um, evaporation, and this is some images from the high Andes in Indonesia, uh, sorry, in Chile, uh, the high Andes in South America and Chile. And uh, as you probably know, we need a lot of lithium and also a bit of boron for making batteries. And um, this is one of the main sources uh, for lithium in the future. It's these salars, as they're called, the salt lakes. And here's one of these salt lakes, and there's a few lonely flamingos here. And uh, here you see the lake drying up, if you will, and once the lake is dried up, it's basically a crust of salt that stretches for literally hundreds of kilometers. 
and um, this can be quarried, and uh, this contains a lot of lithium. So here we have a natural occurrence, and the lithium comes from the volcanoes. So the water brings it to the lakes, but originally the volcanoes bring it from the depths of the earth. So here, most of the lithium is actually volcanic in origin. And well, there's discussion about um, um, how much lithium we might need in the future. Maybe technology will step forward and less lithium will be needed than we think right now. But the estimates of our requirements for lithiums are phenomenal. We probably need 400 times more than we are quarrying right now in order to electrify the traffic. So this is going to be a big challenge, and the volcanoes can hopefully help us with that. So here's a few impressions from those areas. And as I said, when we think about electric uh, cars and uh, batteries, then lithium is vital. Lithium and cobalt are the two critical elements here. 